Um, getting a better understanding of the cloud is great. Uh, getting a better understanding of the universe is priceless. <laughs> Tim Bell from CERN. Hi, thanks a lot for the chance to, to come along today. Um, okay, um, so my name's Tim Bell. I'm responsible for the infrastructure at CERN. Um, so I'd like to talk today a little bit about a transformation we've been going through over the past 12 months and are continuing to do so over the next uh, 12 to 20 years. So CERN itself um, is an acronym. It stands for the Conseil Européen de Recherche Nucléaire. And it's basically the European Center for Particle Physics. So this is fundamental research. Our, our basic job is trying to look at the universe, understand what it's made of, and how it works. We were formed in 1954 after the Second World War with an aim of scientists around Europe to get together and work on fundamental science. Um, this is blue sky research, so there are no direct applications that come out of the work that we're doing. It is an organization funded by the taxpayers of Europe. It's an international organization. Um, we actually uh, have the ability to stop the police force coming on site. Uh, we have our own fire brigade. Um, it runs like an independent country. It's situated between France and Switzerland on the border, um, between the Jura Mountains and the, and the Alps. And it's spread over a campus area of about 20, 25 kilometers. So what do physicists wake up in the morning and worry about? A physicist's got four things on their mind at the moment. The first is, why do we have mass at all? It's good that we do, uh, because otherwise we'd be zooming around at the speed of light. Um, but we don't have a good explanation for that. Now, there is a theory um, where scientists over the past 40 years have put together called the standard model. And we've gradually been piecing together pieces of the jigsaw. There are still two or three pieces that we need to confirm, and one piece in particular, which is a theory called the Higgs boson, is something we're trying to home in on at the moment, and it's looking quite promising. Um, we've certainly seen something. Uh, the results of the past three years of research were demonstrated in July, and there's something looking very intriguing there. This has been described as discoveries of science equivalent to landing a man on the moon. The second thing that people worry about is we've lost 96% of the universe. Um, <laughs> when we add it all together, we find that we know there are planets, we know there are stars, but then when we look at how they move, there's clearly a lot of other mass out there. So one of our jobs is to try and understand what is that 96% and why is it that we can't see it in normal, uh, normal activities. The third thing we worry about is that why are we not half antimatter and half matter? Um, it's really good that we're not because we would immediately annihilate in a huge puff of energy. But there's no logic that explains why if we take the Big Bang, the single core of energy that started off the universe, that we shouldn't be half antimatter and half matter. There must be an asymmetry there. And then finally, when we go back 13 billion years to a billionth of a second before the Big Bang, what did matter look like? Um, there weren't any atoms, there weren't any protons, there weren't any quarks. There was just basically a soup that was there. And that soup is what we understand, want to understand the properties of. So how do we go about doing this? Um, we've assembled a series of collaborations. Um, there are around 11,000 scientists around the world. Um, out of these, it's around 100 countries, 20 of which are member states of CERN. The other countries around the world send scientists to CERN for periods between two weeks to two or three years. And we all collaborate together on those basic questions. What's intriguing here is that this is a huge international collaboration. So the end result of this is that we find large varieties of nationalities working with each other, combining to solve some basic scientific problems. This means putting a lot of international differences beside, but it also creates a very interesting community in which to be working. The flagship project is a project called the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is a 27-mile ring. Um, it's about 100 meters under the ground. Um, the reason why it's under the ground is that, firstly, it would cost too much to buy the land above the ground. And secondly, we need a bit of shielding from the cosmic rays that are coming from the sun uh, and from uh, space. So the 100 meters gives us additional protection for the sensitive scientific equipment underneath to avoid being disturbed from external sources. 
It also creates a very interesting scenario where we're able to do things like measure the tides because the Earth is actually contracting and shrinking, which means that we don't actually have a ring. We have a shape which is continuously being moved around. There are four major experiments around this ring. And as you can see, there's the airport up the top, Lake Geneva. It's a pretty big place. You take 20 minutes to drive from one side to the other. The protons inside the ring are going around at 11,000 times a second at about 99.99 times 8 uh, cent of the speed of light. So they get around a lot faster than the cars do, especially when you have to cross the customs border. <laughs> CERN isn't just the, the Large Hadron Collider, though. Um, there are a large number of other experiments that are uh, working around here. So in particular, we've used some of the older accelerators that we had um, to, to start to charge up the particles. You need to get them to a fair speed before they get into the big ring. But on top of that, we also have a number of other experiments going on. Um, there's one which was in the news uh, about a year ago, which is firing some very special particles called neutrinos to Italy through the Alps. And with this one, we thought we'd found something that uh, had broken the speed of light. But actually, as it turned out, in practice, there were some experimental errors in the equipment. Other experiments are looking at the effects of cosmic rays on cloud formation. And with that, our understanding a little bit about the nature of global warming. And then we also do an experiment which is looking at antimatter. Um, so with this, we've been able to trap antihydrogen in a sealed vessel and study the properties of antimatter. Now, for those of you that have seen Dan Brown or read the book, it's really not like that. <laughs> so the LHC itself was originally conceived in the 1980s. Um, but in order to build an experiment like this, they needed a set of technologies that weren't available at the time. So they already conceived how to do it and the plans for how this could be built. But in the end, it had to wait a certain amount of time for industry to be able to design some of the necessary pieces of equipment. A lot of the hardware that's being used to build these experiments is custom. Um, there aren't any other accelerators anywhere in the world of this size. But after the companies that have helped us build it have done this, then those science that engineering gets used in other applications. So there are now more accelerators in medical use in hospitals than there are in research labs. This is an example of uh, one of the 6,000 magnets that are used within the accelerator. And it's about 35 tons. They have to lower this 100 meters underground. Um, construction started in 2002 and finished in about 2007. So it's a major engineering feat. The tunnel itself, the 17-mile ring, it consists of large tubes like this, um, a series inside. There are two small pipes, about one centimeter across. In order to make sure that the particles can pass through unheeded, the pressure inside those pipes is about 10 times less than the pressure on the moon. Um, in order to bend the particles round the corners to make them uh, do the rings, then we have superconducting magnets that are about 2 degrees Kelvin, so minus 450 Fahrenheit. Um, this requires a lot of equipment around it to make sure that the liquid helium can be passed through and keep the equipment cool. At four places around the ring, we have detectors. Um, these detectors can be viewed as being something like uh, 100 megapixel cameras. So nothing too extreme compared to today's gradual evolution of technology. But they take 40 million pictures a second. Um, this produces a data rate of about one petabyte. So one petabyte a second gets produced from this, and we then have to work out what do we do with it. The, the rough weight, they're around 15,000 tons and stored in caverns that are the largest man-made caverns in the world, about the size of Notre Dame Cathedral. The accelerator is unique. Um, because of that, we're facing unique challenges, and things go wrong. So at the start, after we started up the experiments uh, four years ago, there was a short circuit in one of the areas and the liquid helium at 2 degrees Kelvin started to heat up. This has fairly devastating effects in terms of the ring. Um, to fix that problem, we need to take one year in order to warm up the ring, go in and check all of the connections, and then cool it down again. So we're dealing with real frontier science here. Things do go wrong, but equally lots of things go right. So we've been running since then for three, three and a half years without major incidents and accumulated a lot of data. So what do we see as a, as a physicist? Um, in the simple cases, we have these large experiments. The experiments themselves, they detect when the particles collide. They produce showers of other particles, which are detected in the various layers based on their energy, based on their charge. 
and we get beautiful pictures like this. These are very simple cases where we had a single two sets of protons colliding. Um, in the case of the more complicated ones, we now send through uh, about two, 3,000 bunches. Each bunch has around 100 billion protons in them. And the result is that you get about 600 million collisions a second. Um, this causes a lot of difficulty for the guys writing the software because you have to work out from all of this what went on, what was the actual original collision, what were the original particles. To really push things to a limit, since protons on their own can be sent round, we can also send round lead ions. This is a combination of 200 protons and neutrons. And when these collide, then we get the quark gluon plasma, which is right, before the, uh, sorry, right after the Big Bang. Um, temperature is roughly equivalent to 100,000 times the temperature at the center of the sun. So from a computing point of view, we've got a petabyte a second coming out of these experiments. Um, we don't have the money or the technology to record this level of data. So we have farms of 2,000 to 3,000 standard machines looking at this data and trying to work out what's interesting, filtering that data down and sending it to the central computer center. So each of the, compute, each of the centers, uh, the experiments there, um, 100 meters underground, is producing data. We now total about five gigabytes a second coming into the computer center. That data, our job at the CERN Center is basically to record that data, to make sure there's a copy of it and have a good look at it. We don't have enough capacity to actually analyze the data. So we're using uh, computing grids to distribute that data around the world. So there's the CERN Center, the Tier 0. There are 11 other centers, the Tier 1s, that have a copy of the data. So we have one copy and one of the Tier 1s have a copy. And then there are 200 centers attached to those Tier 1s that do the anal analysis. These run about one million jobs every day. It's a seriously complicated set of orchestration to arrange this data distribution. So the CERN Computer Center itself, we have about 64,000 cores. Um, most of the machines are basic white box style uh, environments. We can analyze individual events separately, which means we don't need to have a massive parallel computer. We just have off-the-shelf, rack-mounted, Ethernet-connected boxes. We just have quite a lot of them. At the same time, we have a fair amount of disk capacity, uh, around 64,000 disks. And that means we deal with inevitable high failure rates. Um, so we're looking at about 2,000 disks breaking every year. Um, this is about 10 times larger than the mean time predicted by the manufacturers. <laughs> so comparing this with Google and Amazon, then we are all seeing very similar data rates. So it looks as if it's something related to large amounts of racking, vibration, rather than individual units. But we're at the sort of statistics where we can genuinely validate some of this calculation. So along with the compute problem, we have a basic data problem. The, the data problem can be summarized in terms of we have about 25 petabytes every year at the moment coming from the experiments. Um, the physicists want to keep this for 20 years. Um, you do the maths, it's a fairly frightening number. Um, it gets more frightening that we're stopping the accelerator for a year, and then after that, they're going to be doubling the energy, which means that we're likely to be hitting numbers towards 30, 35 petabytes every year uh, for the period after that. The data rates themselves, although six gigabytes a second is usual, we're often seeing data rates up to 25 gigabytes a second when we get those uh, heavy iron collisions with the quark gluon plasma. So, there's a fair amount of data infrastructure that needs to go on to look after this sort of data. The computer center itself, it's a beautiful building in nine, built in the 1970s. It used to have a mainframe and a cray, and everything was really nice and straightforward. Nowadays, um, it's the kind of building that makes the environmentalists uh, worry. I won't give you the PUE numbers, but they're, they're fairly scary. Um, the worst thing about it is that we can't get the cooling to a very high level. As you can see from the empty racks here, we're able to only get six kilowatts for each of the racks. Um, we have some wide aisles. The reason for that is that the computer center itself is a relatively open environment. Um, we have tens of thousands of visitors coming through every year to CERN to come and see the experimental facilities. And also, you can have a tour of the computer center. So if you're ever in Geneva, then uh, you can arrange to have a visit. We had 80,000 people through one weekend uh, three years ago uh, as part of our outreach uh, activities. The other thing that people sometimes don't think about is actually how we store all of our data. And we've actually found tape is an affordable and economic way of doing this. 
So we have about 45,000 tapes currently. Um, this allows us to store and manage the data with a reasonable power budget and a reasonable economic budget. It would be great to have this stuff on disk, but we're not able to afford that. We're largely a read at load, um, so we do about 20% write and about 80% read. The tapes themselves, we do about 60,000 tape mounts every week. So if you imagine your VHS tape recorder and what happens if you put in 60,000 times, they break quite often. So we keep the robots busy. So given the growth of computing, given the extent to which we're going to move to a higher energy, then how are we going to solve that? We have a, a problem on the CERN site, which is that the accelerator takes 120 megawatts of energy. So this is equivalent to a small town. And they're only able to give us three megawatts. So from that, we couldn't expand the computing facilities on the site. So instead, we had to look at how do we go about building a second computer center. In the end, we asked our member states to make us an offer for hosting. So uh, we chose a site in Hungary. Uh, where we're able to locate roughly the same amount of computer equipment as we have currently. It'll be a hands-off site, so basically we'll have people to do disk swapping and uh, machine installation and removal, but we'll be managing everything from the center. And this will be deployed at the start of 2013. So that's the good news, we've got the capacity. The bad news is that we're actually on an economic situation that means we can't increase the staff levels. So that means that we've got twice as many machines to manage and the same number of guys. This means that we need to think about how we're doing things. We did a lot of our work about 10 years ago um, building a set of fabric management tools looking after the computer center. It was around a time when we were leading edge on the compute side. And as we now look around, we find that we're not leading edge anymore. Um, in terms of the compute capacity, there are sites that are many sites bigger than ours. So, Around a year ago, we took a fundamental think of how we were managing our computer center and worked out actually that we weren't special anymore. That instead, we should be looking at how other people are doing things and then looking to improve and adapt those tools rather than writing our own ourselves. So we followed the Google toolchain model, selected a large bunch of different uh, tools, um, key ones there naturally being Puppet, uh, OpenStack, Atlassian tools for managing tickets, uh, Koji for building. And with this set of tools, we've actually managed to avoid writing any significant components. So we had to do a certain amount of customization to link in with legacy systems, but we've been able to build an entire tool chain in about 12 months, uh, an activity that previously was taking 10 years. At the same time, we found some great benefits. Um, it used to be that what would happen is when you joined the infrastructure teams, you would be taken and sat next door to one of the gurus who would coach you for two months, a bit like joining an apprenticeship. And at the end of that, you were sort of passed on the secrets. Now what happens is you start new at CERN, and we get told, go off and buy a book, sit down and read it, and then you'll be productive. And this is helping hugely in terms of the ability of people to join, contribute. We're actually finding also that we now find that people say, I don't need to read the book. I've already been using Puppet in other places. And they're very, very good at helping us to understand how we can best use the tools. At the same time, as Luke showed this chart um, yesterday, many people at CERN are on short-term contracts uh, up to five years. One of the goals of CERN is to educate the staff from the member states. So they come for five years, spend time with us, and then go back to their member states with that knowledge. Now we're in a situation where they're going back to their member states with in-depth knowledge of Puppet and how it works, rather than some custom local tools that are not useful for them. That means their opportunities in the job market are hugely higher as a result. However, we had one additional problem. So along with the fact that we had to manage so many machines, we also have a problem of efficiency. Um, when you ask for a tape, then it can take up to five minutes to go and get that tape. During that time, the machine on which you're running can be idle. So we're moving towards a cloud model. Um, this allows us to be looking at doing overcommitment of resources, more easy scheduling, and in particular, being able to arrange that when we have uh, hardware warnings, we're able to drain the machines in a transparent fashion for the long-running programs that are on them. At the same time, we want to be able to be addressing people's requirements to ask for a machine in, in a reasonable period. So in particular, people used to be asking for boxes and get them in a period of six months. Um, now they're able to ask for machines, go off and get a coffee and come back. The service model we've been looking is uh, following a, a model that cloud scaling has proposed. And basically, 
this splits machines into two forms, the pets. Um, these are the guys, you give them nice names, you stroke them, you look after them. When they get ill, you nurse them back to health lovingly, taking a long time over it. The cattle, you give them numbers. When they get ill, you shoot them. <laughs> so, the aim that we have is to move our users towards a cattle model. <laughs> but if we can't, then what we want is that they're configuring their pets in a reasonably producible fashion. So in order to deliver this cloud structure, um, we're looking at OpenStack. Um, I've lost count of the number of talks yesterday that mentioned OpenStack, and there are a lot more today that, that, that will mention it. Um, but it's certainly a key factor as part of this strategy to bring together a number of uh, technologies and allow us to be more efficient. So we've been contributing uh, to various areas, integrating into the environment, and we'll continue doing that in the future. At the same time, when we're faced with an OpenStack configuration exercise, for, for those of you that have been through it and done it by hand, it's hard work. Um, there are a lot of different components, and there are a lot of options. And one of the challenges when we were looking at how do we deploy OpenStack at scale was how to put together all these components in a reasonably structured way. This is where we found some open source projects combined. So we had some great results from working with Dan Bode on the Puppet Forge OpenStack modules. Um, for those of you that are configuring OpenStack other ways, have a look at this. This has really allowed us to be moving in a very efficient way and equally to be contributing back. One of the key things that Dan is doing is to make sure that when people find improvements, they don't go and fork. What they do is they contribute back to the key modules and help others, and we are doing the same thing. So with this, we all benefit from each other's work. At the same time, we've been using Foreman to do our provisioning and user kiosk. This allows a user to come along through a nice graphical user interface and ask for configuration in a host group that they're aware of. The combination of the three has allowed us to do things that we used to be looking at dr dreaming of previously in terms of providing a very friendly user environment and a very automated process behind. So a typical example of this we had was um, a couple of weeks ago where there's a project called LHC at Home. Um, don't worry, this isn't a case where you go and build an accelerator in your basement. It's a SETI-like uh, project where we run simulation of particles going around magnets. And with this combination, we were able to spin up 1,000 virtual machines in about half a day running this uh, analysis. So we were able to find modules off, the, the, off GitHub, we are able to provision them with OpenStack, and we were able to then orchestrate and run that out. It's a dramatic change compared to how we used to previously be provisioning by sitting down and planning for a number of days, weeks, in terms of how we do all the cross dependencies. So where do we go from here? Um, so in this afternoon, um, Ben Jones is talking in more detail about these areas. Um, so you're welcome to come along and find in more detail. But in particular, we're now looking at how do we scale out. Rough calculations in terms of budget, in terms of what we're able to manage, is that we're heading towards 15,000 hypervisors in 2015. The current computing models say that will be around 100,000 to 300,000 virtual machines. Um, it gets kind of scary when you look at those numbers. Um, we're looking at something like 100 cores as part of a puppet master infrastructure at the moment. On the other hand, 100 cores is way cheaper than employing a large number of people to be looking after this infrastructure manually. At the same time, we're looking at working with the other centers around the computing grid to help them also adopt Puppet. Um, there are already a number of labs that have been working in this area, and we're sharing various uh, configuration options with them so they can bring up some of the scientific code more easily. And then finally, there are some areas of pain for us. Um, Linux desktops, Mac desktops, uh, keyboard mouse switches, uh, PDUs, all these areas are areas where we want to be having a look to see how can we configure and manage more easily. So uh, final thoughts on this on, on community. Um, during the 1990s, um, we had a guy in an office just down from where I am at the moment um, who invented something called the World Wide Web. And at the time, I remember there was a lot of discussion around, you know, should this be monetized? Should we be trying to uh, keep ownership of it? And one of the best decisions CERN made was to make this completely open source and give it back to the world. It's revolutionized the past 20 years of uh, uh, computing environment. 
When I look at things like Puppet and OpenStack at the moment, I see similar styles of communities working. Now, we've had a lot of practice from the World Wide Web in how to build those communities. And with that, we can then solve some major problems looking forward. Certainly, the idea of facing 300,000 virtual machines on our own is something we wouldn't take on. But with the community behind us and others sharing similar problems, we have a chance to solve it. So I'll leave you with one of the beautiful pictures that we get from the, the CMS experiment. And just to say that when you are contributing to Puppet and to Puppet Forge, then you are helping to find that 96% of the universe that we're missing. <laughs> so, thank you. So I say, come along to see uh, Ben this afternoon. He'll give you uh, more of the technical details of how things are, are implemented. So there, I, I see there are a lot of people standing over by the edge. So if you see any open seats, go ahead and take them. It's OK. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. Just wanted to say that. Um, I don't even know what to think about now. <laughs> <laughs>